Dearly beloved in Christ, another year has flown by. Another year in the history of mankind, and another year in our lives is gone. Thinking back to last January, the beginning of 2023, no one could say for sure what that year would bring. In some cases, we can make broad or educated guesses and predict correctly, but the point is that no one knows the future for sure unless it has been revealed to him by God. 2023 may have held unspeakable sufferings for some who had no idea what was in store for them at the beginning of the year. Perhaps some loved ones passed away suddenly and unexpectedly, or some calamity destroyed someone's company and livelihood and left them destitute. Certainly, these things happened, and the people to whom these things happened had no idea that these things would befall them. Our Lord tells us we know not the day nor the hour when the Son of Man will come, although sometimes we try to predict the second coming of Christ But we should take this example of not even knowing what will happen to us tomorrow, let alone what will happen in the year ahead of us. To start off the year as part of our New Year's resolution is always a good thing to meditate on what one would do if he knew that he was going to die within the next several months. Not that we want to be morbid, but that we know for certain that we will die at some point, and we have no idea when that is. So it behooves good Catholics to think about it every once in a while. So we prepare for the worst as far as is reasonable, and we prepare for the best as often as we, and we, prepare, we pray for the best as often as we can. But the saints, too, knew they had only a little time here on earth, during which to serve God and to earn their eternal reward. We ought to reflect on the year past and see whether we could have done better on a specific point. If we struggle with grievous sin, now is the acceptable time to change our lives. Now the okay, now uh, sorry. Now is the acceptable time to change our ways, not next year, not next month, not next week, not even tomorrow. Today, let us do all that we can to avoid the occasions of sin and completely defeat the enemy at our doorstep. For truly the devil is at the doorstep, and he awaits you to open the door to temptation even a little so that he can try to put in his foot, and pry the rest of the way open, and thus cause our spiritual ruin. Don't give him the opportunity. How important it is that we use our time well, and we prepare for these things. Work well while you have the daytime, because the night will come when we can no longer work. Looking back over the year past, we also notice that God has blessed us with many graces and favors. So we are also further indebted to God for his mercy and his love toward us. We pay off this debt by thanking God for these blessings and by doing penance for our past sins. In a meditation book I was reading, the author prompts us to reflect upon the past year and the sins that we have committed during the course of the year as it draws to a close. And in this way, we can better understand the sorrow that must fill the sacred heart of Jesus and and did fill his sacred heart during his passion. Jesus could see that every year sins would flood into the world even after he redeemed us. Christ's sorrow was all the keener because of his great love for his heavenly Father. He says, and also because he well knew the number and gravity of the sins that would be committed. He beheld God, ignored and misunderstood, little loved and poorly served by the greater part of mankind, receiving in exchange for his divine love nothing but coldness and ingratitude when the response did not go so far as to include open hostility, injury, and piety, and revolt towards the supreme being. He foresaw the great number of people who would fall, 
who would fail to recognize in themselves and in their neighbor the very image of God, and consequently how lacking they would be in the love and reverence due to one another, be it in body or soul, in temporal goods or in things spiritual. Who could adequately describe the nature and extent of the sorrow that must have overwhelmed the sacred heart of Jesus at the sight of such disorders? But it is a wonderful thing that we understand and we act upon the necessity of making reparation, not only for our sins, but for the sins of the world as well. Without pious and self-sacrificing Catholics who seek to appease the wrath of God, where would the world be? Who would make atonement for the outrages committed against the loving heart of Jesus? Let us not imagine that there are plenty of others who will make atonement, who will sacrifice their personal time in order to make a visit to the Blessed Sacrament, or who will pray and do penance. Comparatively, those who seek to make atonement for the sins of the world are a small group, but they are so very necessary. The Church, before the abomination of Vatican II, had many religious institutes full of religious who would pray, fast, and sacrifice for mankind, that the wrath of God might be assuaged, and that these poor souls who offended God so much might be able to go to heaven. But now we know that those who infiltrated the Church effectively ruined countless vocations to the priesthood and the religious life. And now we find ourselves in a place much like the early days of the church, in a time when the average layman had to, has to struggle against the pagan world and its influence with all his might, and even sometimes to lay down his life for his faith. During this coming year, let us renew our efforts to make reparation for the offenses committed against our Lord and God. Truly, God desires us all to come home to him who loves us and wishes to see us happy forever with him in eternity. He wishes the prodigal son to return, for there is more rejoicing in heaven over the returning of a single sinner than over all the just in paradise. Our Lady of Fatima told us that so many souls go to hell because there is no one who would pray for them while they struggled here on earth. While we reflect upon our own sins of the past year and make reparation for our own offenses, let us not forget to pray for the salvation of even the worst sinners on our planet because they too have an immortal soul to save. But first and foremost, of course, we must focus on our own salvation. What does it profit a man if he gain the whole world and suffer the loss of his soul? Let us not neglect to help ourselves first that we may be enabled by God's grace to assist those who are around us. With the beginning of a new year, we have an opportunity to correct our faults and strengthen our good habits. As we know, customarily, people make resolutions for the new year. And these should be something that are not too difficult, but at the same time, they should be something we truly need to work on. A specific resolution that we know if we persevere in throughout the year, will greatly help us to become a better person spiritually. I say something not too hard because we don't want to rashly make a resolution that is so difficult that we are sure to give up and thus we lose all our momentum and even become so disgusted with our inability to persevere in it that we decide not to make any resolutions because we think it is impossible to carry them out. There is a saying that goes, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Not to say that one shouldn't make good resolutions, but essentially the meaning is that good intentions of themselves will not keep us out of hell. We have to act upon our good intentions. Faith without works is dead. It is not enough to merely believe, but we must do the will of our Father who is in heaven. If ye love me, said our Lord, then keep my commandments. One author wrote a few short points on the duties which the new year imposes upon us all. One, he says, 
you ought to examine the use you have made of the past year, the graces received, its joys and its sorrows, and especially your employment of that precious commodity we call time, which once gone can never be recalled. Two, you ought to heartily thank God for all of his benefits. Three, you should humbly ask pardon of your faults. And four, you must resolve to make good use of the experience gained in the past year so as to profit the more in the future, enduring afflictions with more truly Christian sentiments, employing your time to greater advantage, having eternity more constantly in view, and by turning, turning a good account uh, by turning it to good account the further graces which the goodness of God will surely heap upon you. Dear friends in Christ, let us celebrate today's feast with faith and a love of God that is planted firmly in our hearts. Let us go forth with confidence into this new year so that nothing can shake that love and faith. No trial is too great, no temptation is too difficult to overcome, no obstacle is too high to jump over, no mountain is too big that it will refuse to be moved by the power of God if we have a firm faith and a love for him with all our hearts. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.